Welcome to Marin Voices and Views. With Lawrence A. Strick, I'm Peter B. Collins. Today we focus on two towns in the Ross Valley, San Anselmo and Fairfax. In our second segment, Larry Bragman of the Fairfax Town Council will be joining us. But first, Peter, we're going to welcome Tom McInerney, who is in his second term on the San Anselmo Town Council and serves as mayor for the past year. Before that, Tom served on the San Anselmo Park and Recreation Commission. He has a law degree from Santa Clara. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he practices law in San Francisco, employment law in San Francisco. Tom, I'm always curious, what, what motivates someone to, who's a busy guy as a law practice to want to get into public service like you've done? Well, I, uh, I've been involved in various things outside of work um, over the years. It, actually makes life I think more interesting and fun um, and I love San Anselmo and we moved here in two th uh, 1997 or to, uh, beginning in 1998 and I've really loved San Anselmo and you know our kids we have raised our kids here so wanted to really give back to the community um, got really motivated more after t in 2005 after the uh, New Year's Eve flood in San Anselmo so I got involved at that point after with um, with our Park and Rec Commission. I'd been involved in my kids' school, which is St. Anselm School. I was head of their board for a period, um, but got involved in the Park and Rec Commission and you know, just realized, I, I think that we, a lot of these towns um, in Marin and elsewhere, you have a lot of longtime residents that are involved, but the kind of newer generation are less likely to get involved. A lot of times they're just so busy with school and kids and, and life. I, I felt that it, it was time for kind of new blood to get involved. So I got involved and we've really tried hard to recruit others um, to get involved as well. And now I'm, I'm no longer as young as I was. And so I'm becoming part of the older generation, but we really, Towns like San Anselmo really need new blood involved. So that's what really got me involved. The flood in 2005 is something I recall vividly. And it was so fast. It was a flash flood that came in, did millions of dollars in damage, and then it, it drained away. And the efforts to mitigate future potential floods uh, <coughs> produced a flood fee that Hal Brown helped uh, uh, engineer and that voters passed. And I'd like you to give us a, a status update on where the projects stand uh, and if, if we have taken any meaningful steps to prevent damage from the next flood. Right. Uh, great question. I'm actually, in, in addition to being mayor of San Anselmo, I'm currently the head of the Flood Zone 9, which is the county flood district that um, the Ross Valley's overseeing. And, and you chair the San Anselmo Flood Committee. I do, mm -hmm. right. And uh, so I'm intimately involved and a lot of work has been done. A lot of it is, uh, these are larger projects that because of, they're in the midst of a pu very public process with all of them. So, and they are going to unfortunately require uh, a number of years of planning and public input and preparation. So right now what we've, uh, there are various things that are in different stages of planning and implementation. Uh, San Anselmo has obtained grant money that's paying for almost the entire uh, funding of a number of bridge replacements in town. In town, a lot of our bridges act as impediments of the creek. So we've got mostly state funding for almost the entire replacement of about f uh, four or five of our bridges. We are, uh, for the Ro elsewhere in the Ross Valley, we've identified areas of potential um, detention basins, um, Phoenix Lake, Memorial Park, Lefty Gomez Field, um, another one up in, uh, in Fairfax or in the, in the county area outside of Fairfax with the goal to these will be areas where we can hold water during intense rainstorms and then gradually release them so they don't all just come running down the creek and flood our business districts and residential communities because as you noted that was where there was significant 
um, not only economic impact to residents, but a, you know terrible um, environmental impacts as well. So we're in the, pro the a number of those detention basins are in different stages of planning. Phoenix Lake is probably the furthest along, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know also then you have like a, a det uh, the detention basin plan in Memorial in for Memorial Park in San Anselmo. Um, and then there are other ones, Unit 4, which is the area in Ross, which is a long history there, but the portion of the creek in Ross is actually governed by the federal government, and they need, we, they need to do a widening and are and a basically, a, you know, some work at, at that Unit 4 that goes from kind of the Ross Bridge up till near the border of San Anselmo. We've been partnering and working with the Army Corps of Engineers and with our leaders in Washington to get dedicated funding for that. Um, you know, we really need that, and so we've been spending a lot of time, Katie Rice, with her leadership, she is obviously the successor to Hal Brown. She's gone to Washington. We've gotten some commitments from the local leadership of the Army Corps, but more needs to be done. A number of other pieces uh, moving on it. There are just a million moving pieces, all kind of being uh, in, the, in various stages of planning all, like I indicated, are part of a public process. So we're moving on some things. The bridges are kind of the furthest along, but we have mm -hmm. some other things the, to do. The plan to catch, to use uh, Memorial Park and Lefty Gomez Field as sort of a catch basin by mm -hmm. digging it out so that you pool the water and have a, a, mm -hmm. a measured release. Um, seems like an intuitive idea. I, I understand there's a bunch of community pushback on that. Mm -hmm. What, what what are you hearing about that, and is there a plan that has uh, more widespread agreement between the folks? Well, there um, there I, I think generally there is wide support for it. There are a number of uh, folks who you know primarily live near the park who um, have um, I think not a clear idea of what is being planned or a misunderstanding, and it's that's going to happen with any kind of major project. So. It's going to re require further discussion with with the members, uh, people who live near the park, and others. Part of what I'm hearing is just kind of fear of change and fear that we're going to destroy, which is really a gem, San Anselmo. We want to make I think people, everyone wants to make the park better. It's in really a decaying state. It's never really had any major overhaul. The irrigation is terrible. The drainage is awful for anybody who's had a child play soccer there because the systems are so old. This would give us a chance to replace that and to the drainage and irrigation and, and leave a really m much more beautiful park. People are fearful of, oh, what about the playground? Are we going to lose that? plan is to keep a playground, is to keep that playground. We need to fix the playground. It's kind of falling apart at this point, but it would be to keep that tennis court. So we still want to hold, we will continue to have, a, you know, a gem of a park is the plan. But part of it is, I think, generally, and you see this with any major project, kind of a fear of change. And so people are very fearful and skeptical of government. So we have to overcome that and address the concerns and make sure we do an in, get the input, make changes if necessary. But it's, I think, uh, kind of a low impact project. I'd rather do something like this than dig out the creek and do concrete channel or put walls around the creek, which would have, I think, devastating environmental impacts. So this is kind of the lowest impact to hold back, really, a, the huge amount of water that comes in heavy rainstorms. Now, the flood fee has just been increased by 3%, mostly to pay for public relations consultants to sell this to people like me. <laughs> I don't really need to be sold, Tom, but is this a wise use of the money? Well, I'll quibble with your characterization of it. I know the, the IJ um, had kind of characterized it that way. What I would say is when the flood fee passed, it, the flood fee actually provided for up to 3% raise every year. It's been in existence for seven years, and it's never had an increase. So there, um, this is the first increase ever. So while the IJ characterized that as to pay for a, a public relations person, I would dispute that. In fact, they should have probably been raising it before that because there are costs involved with consultants and engineers and other people planning these projects, and the cost of living increases, and we've never had a cost of living increase on this. It just so happens that this year, in part, we're also 
uh, retaining, and it's not a, they're not PR specialists per se. What they are, there's a firm that works with, they're mo I would say mainly an engineering firm that, that will assist on public outreach for as we get into the CEQA process and the very public process to help with outreach because, and it's not just to sell the projects, but to get, make sure we get adequate input because um, right now we're going in a very public phase and the engineers involved in the projects just don't have the skills, I think, and the time to do that. So they'll assist with that. So uh -huh. your council, let's, I want to switch subjects a little mm -hmm. bit. Your council has been dealing with a controversy involving one of your members, uh, Ford Green. Uh, and that's regarding zoning and permits for a mixed-use building that he owns and live with, lives in, I think operates uh, his business out of. To avoid conflicts, the, the council brought in outside an outside administrative law judge who ruled against Mr. Green. Uh, Green has sued San Anselmo in, in Superior Court here in Marin. That's fairly unusual. What's your read on what's going on with that situation? Well, I think it's very unfortunate. I um, joined the council because I wanted to work collaboratively and cooperatively with, uh, with my colleagues and with staff um, and to make things better in San Anselmo and, and in the Ross Valley. The, the challenge, um, and without getting to, into too much detail because it is subject to litigation, my disappointment in this is that we, Ford has believed that their various state and, and local ordinances should not apply to his building, that he shouldn't have to follow the, t uh, the terms of the state fire code as it, as it applies to his um, commercial building. I've had many discussions with him and I sat down with him in his, in his uh, place a couple years ago and we discussed how Ford, is, and I basically said, Ford it's untenable that we, you, You'll need to make. You'll need to legalize your property. We can't have a sitting council member who is not. He's. This has been subject to back and forth with the town since I think 2005 or 2007 thereabouts before he was ever on the council. Um, and he said he would, and he would work with us. And I worked. I tr I thought we were on a path where he would apply for a permit, which he ended up doing and we would have his property legalized without any real dispute. Unfortunately, it kind of got off the rails where he then he is arguing that he shouldn't have to comply. And it just, I, um, I, I, we, he can make his arguments, he's presented his arguments to the planning commission, seven members of whom he's appointed. They all rejected his arguments. He, we brought in, as you said, at great expense, an independent judge to listen to his arguments, and he rejected his arguments and said it wasn't even a close call, factually or legally. So he's going to keep pushing this, and you know, unfortunately, we can't just say sorry. We're not going to apply the the fire and building codes to you. We're going to ignore you. Unfortunately, we have to because everyone else has to comply. And when we were elected to the council, we swore an oath to uphold and enforce the law. And unfortunately, we, you know, not unfortunately, but we do. And we can't look the other way. I wish there was a way we could, uh, you know, he could just, you know, accept the ruling of the independent judge, but apparently he doesn't want to. Now, Tom, to be fair, I've known Ford for over 30 years, and I have spoken uh, on his behalf uh, during this mm -hmm. contentious proceeding. It's unusual and it's uncomfortable, but I don't think that any member of the council gives up their right to pursue legal action to protect their property when they get elected. And at the August uh, 12th meeting, which by the way was uh, one of the first that was broadcast on video here on Marin Cable, uh, you and Councilman Wright and uh, one other member, uh, uh, Doug um, Kelly, uh, Kelly kind of uh, uh, skirted the law on the Brown Act and started to talk about this issue. And you all advised Ford that he should either drop the suit or resign. I, I think that's highly inappropriate. Okay, well, uh, yeah, and you are right. You spoke at, uh, at his proceeding at the, in, front of the, in front of this independent judge. Um, I would, you know, I'll take issue with saying skirting the Brown Act. As Ford knows, I, as, and as he has well exercised, I exercised my First Amendment right at the meeting to state my opinion. Um, and my, what, I, what I pointed out was kind of uh, along the lines of what I said here. It's, 
you know, he's had an opportunity to present his arguments to the Planning Commission, to the independent judge. Now is it, and he's, and they've all rejected it. Now's the time to move on for the betterment of San Anselmo. And I, um, and that's what I said. And I also went on to say that the, uh, the challenge for him is he's sitting in judgment on our budgets and making decisions involving staff that he's also making, as you know, vitriolic comments, accusing them of I, I don't support, attacking and bullying I don't, I don't him. support his, you know, inappropriate okay. remarks right. to the staff. And it's, it's very, and so at the same time to sit there and attack them and be making judgments on them, I think puts us in a very difficult spot. And I, my preference would be, because I've always pr previously had a very good working relationship with Ford, and he is a, you know, a sharp guy on a number of issues, I wish he would kind of just accept the fact that he unfortunately lost, and he needs to legalize his property. Um, if he, and uh, it just puts us all in a difficult spot when we're acting, we're suing, and we're, uh, you know, on the one hand and attacking and then casting judgment and making decisions over our budget and other things. It just puts us in a difficult pred predicament. So that was, that was my point, was not, Ford, you must resign. It was my intent and goal is, let's move on with your, you know, drop your lawsuit and let's, you know, live. And, and there are a number of th opportunities, things he can do. Ollie Ford, and I've said this to Ford uh, uh, as well, he can just move upstairs to one of his legal units. He could do that, but he told me he just, it doesn't pencil out. Is well, let's, let's, I'm, I'm sorry, let's, let's not we're, litigate we're, this now. Yeah, we're okay. over we're time. time. We need okay. to wrap up. I'm glad to hear your point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I do support uh, his rights as a private property owner, and I also just want to point out that I've had uh, a fair amount of contact with the Planning Commission in San Anselmo over the 23 years I've lived there, and I've found them to be arbitrary and quite inconsistent. Okay. And I think that there are important issues to address uh, even beyond the specifics of Ford's case. And Tom I McInerney. am going to call the question on this particular <laughs> debate right now, and thank you, Tom, for coming to Marin Voices and Views, and uh, I'm sure that we'll hear a little bit more about Mr. Mr. Green's suit and how San Anselmo responds. Thanks a lot okay, for coming thank by. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tom returns to our show today. Larry is a member of the Fairfax Town Council, currently its vice mayor. He serves on the board of the Marin Telecommunications Agency and the board of Community Media Center Marin with me. Recently he's announced that he's running for a seat on the board of the Marin Municipal Water District. Larry and I went to law school together at USF and I want to disclose that I've made a small contribution to Larry's campaign for the water board. Welcome. Thanks a lot, you guys. And he owes me five bucks because I told him not to say water board. So. <laughs> oh, right. It's two words. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to water board, Mr. Bragman. Um, welcome, Larry. Thanks a lot. Around the country, residents are really vocal, and in the county, they're really vocal about housing issues. The planning process of urban versus suburban and infilling the suburban areas is creating all kinds of havoc on local elections. Your council recently passed an ordinance 778, which permitted uh, the building of 124 units at various places in Fairfax. Uh, former Mayor Frank Egger led a petition drive to put the issue on the ballot. I don't know how it happened, but in August, your board repealed 778. Can you give us an update of what that all means and what's going on? What it means is, um all local jurisdictions are under the scrutiny of the State uh, Department of Housing and Community Development to meet housing quotas, be they uh, affordable or market rate. It's both. It's not just affordable housing. It's both uh, affordable housing and what's defined as affordable housing and also market rate housing. And in order to effectuate that, each jurisdiction has to do what's called a housing element, which is basically a policy statement stating how they're going to meet the goals. And what the methodology is to meet those goals is that the state really micromanages your planning and zoning um, authority in each jurisdiction to encourage the construction of new units to meet those mandates. 
So we took a long time to work up the policy statement, which is a separate document called the housing element after many, really years of negotiations with HCD. Uh, finally got it approved. Um, that was back in December, October of 2012, okay? Flash forward, um, we, had a house, we had a building application come before the council to build a gas station. It was a franchise. And during the course of the deliber deliberations over that application, we discovered that we needed to pass an ordinance enacting that policy. 778 was that ordinance. There are two steps in approving an ordinance. There's the first hearing, second hearing. At the second hearing on the ordinance, a group of residents came in with a list of a bill of particulars objecting to certain portions of the ordinance and also pointing out certain drafting errors that were in the ordinance. Uh, I moved to continue the hearing. I, you know, I had struggled with it because we had taken a long time and a lot of resources to get to that point. <clears throat> but um, I felt that we needed to at least continue the process of hearing out the residents. The council decided they wanted to move forward with it. The, the, uh, the ordinance was adopted on a four to one vote. Um, and within two weeks, we had a referendum circulated with 1,000 signatures by Fairfax residents. And under the elections code, once a referendum is certified to have a, number, a sufficient number of signatures, the legislative body, in this case, the Fairfax Town Council, has two choices. You either put the ordinance on the ballot or you repeal the ordinance. As we went through the process, we found that the ordinance did indeed have a number of what I would call material, textual mistakes and errors. And let me ask, because uh, Frank Egger has suggested that those were not mistakes, that those were intentional uh, uh, attempts to actually raise the ceiling on the number of units that could be built. I think uh, the way I look back at the whole process, if, if you look at the way the whole process was done and that ordinance was approved and the housing element was drafted, it wasn't just staff, it wasn't just consultants that looked at those documents. It was staff, it was consultants, it was the planning commission, it was the affordable housing committee, and it was the town council. So I think we all bear responsibility for the fact that that document just wasn't ready for prime time. And, uh, you know, frankly, I don't know how the, the errors were made. There were mistakes that were made and it went through all the different levels of review. So it, it really, is, it sounds like you're back to ground first base on this thing pretty much. Well, I think not first base. Well, I think how would it affect then? The we're out of the batter's box, okay? Because we've got a housing element which at least identifies various opportunity sites to consider for rezoning. So I think the plan now is we'll take it piece by piece. The 778 dealt with the entire housing element in one swell foop, and it just was <laughs> too, it was too much, and it was too complicated, and it just was sort of impenetrable. And I think our approach now is gonna be sort of, if not project by project, zone by zone. So it's a much more focused approach and a much more, um, a, an approach that we can kind of get our hands around. And I think more importantly, that the residents of Fairfax can get their collective hands around. So they so, understand so what So briefly, we're doing. one more question on this. What is the status of the Christ Lutheran Church plan to build 40 affordable units? They say it's at risk because they could lose their funding due to the delays. Right now, under our existing zoning ordinance, um, that project can and should submit an application for rezoning as a planned district development. And we have existing processes and procedures to do that right now that are in place. And um, we're trying to encourage them to do it. All right, let's talk about the water district. Uh, 
you announced that you're going to be running for a position on the board. What are the issues that are out there that led you to throw your hat in the ring? Well, I think the fundamental issue is what kind of uh, water district um, are we going to have? Is it going to be a district that really um, uses a commodity sale of water as its approach, or are we going to create a district that really looks at its mission as a natural resource management and conservation agency. And I, I think we can do better if we take the second approach. So I think that's the fundamental issue, is trying to shift the district from a commodity-based operation to really a sustainable watershed-based operation. When you say commodity-based, you mean selling water? Selling water. Right. So in other words, that the, oper the operational budget really depends on water sales. And, you know, I think water sales are, are a fair way to raise revenue, but when you're dealing with water, which is a fundamental human right, and when you're dealing uh, with a crisis like we're dealing with now with global warming and the immediate drought that we're in, you can't take a 19th century approach to a 21st century situation. And, and, and we need to kind of move the needle a little bit so that we catch up with the science and the technology of where where we are where we are now i don't think we need any more dams or desalination to create a sustainable and reliable water system here in marin we are really lucky in marin to actually have a productive watershed that can if managed properly produce enough high quality water to provide reliable drinking water and the type of uh, supply that will um, sustain our economic vitality. You touched on desalination. Is there any case where you could support desalination of bay water? Right now, there is a uh, consortium of Bay Area water districts. There's five Bay Area water districts that are looking into building a desalination plant in the East Bay. Um, they have looked at several different locations. One was at the foot of the New Bay Bridge, another one was also in the East Bay, the western part of the East Bay. The third one is at the East Contra Costa um, facility. And it, it looks like from my review of the documents to date, which admittedly is pretty fresh, that the preferred site is the East Contra Costa site, which is a delta site. So right now, the site that they're looking at is a delta brackish water site. It's not a seawater site. It's another mm -hmm. uh, water draw from the delta, which is already going to be put under tremendous pressure uh, by the yeah. state bond issue. Larry, I wish we had more time. Thanks for joining us sure. today on Marin Voices and Views. Sure.